Good morning. If you haven't figured out by now, I'm going to tell you the bad news. Derek's not here this morning. For our visitors, and we do have a whole row of them back there, as well as one up here, uh, I apologize. I am not the full-time preacher here at Conway. Uh, Derek is up in Sedalia this morning preaching at a lectureship, and uh, he asked me several months ago to fill in for him. And I agreed, although every single time I agree, I wonder why, because I'm a nervous wreck. Um, thank you, Nick, for, for reading uh, the scripture this morning um, out of Colossians. I think that most of us, if we've spent uh, any amount of time attending worship services on a regular basis, have heard a lesson out of this particular passage in Colossians. Normally, whenever we do hear that lesson, uh, it's based on forgiveness and forgiveness of others who have wronged you. Just to put my mind at ease so I'm not completely going down the wrong path, if you've heard a lesson based on forgiving others out of this passage, could I see a show of hands? Five. Oh. I know there's been more, but thank you for those who were brave enough to raise their hands. Um, several months ago, I was um, scrolling through social media, and uh, I came upon a quote. I can't remember who it was attributed to. And the quote was, of all the people that I've had to forgive, forgiving myself was the hardest one. <clears throat> And I took a screenshot of that and I sent it to Derek as I do whenever I see something that I think would make a good sermon. And I said, there's, there's a sermon in this. And he texted me back and he said, you're right. You should do it. <laughs> and as I was trying to come up with a topic, I've mentioned that several times, coming up with a topic is the hardest thing I have to do whenever I agree to, to get up and preach. Uh, this, this kept coming back into my, into my mind, and I thought, you know, I know that I struggle with that, and if I struggle with that, then my guess is that I'm not the only one that struggles forgiving myself whenever I've done something wrong, whenever I've sinned against God. We know that in our society... We all personally know and we see those who are unwilling to accept responsibility for their actions. We're all familiar with those who want to pass blame um, on either their upbringing or some sort of extenuating circumstances whenever they make a mistake or involved in indiscretion. And I'm not talking about those kind of people this morning. As Christians, I think that we fall into a different category uh, as Christians, when we recognize sin in our life, uh, we look to correct that problem. Uh, we confront it. We repent of it. We ask for forgiveness. But oftentimes it doesn't necessarily end there. Uh, I think that oftentimes uh, guilt and shame linger with us. And uh, maybe that's because we can't believe that we made such a poor decision. Uh, maybe it's because we can't get out of our mind that look on a loved one's face of shock or of disappointment, maybe of fear. And maybe that haunts us way, way longer than it should. Um, maybe I'm the only one here this morning that deals with this. Uh, I don't think so, but if so, welcome to my own personal counseling session. Bear with me. I want to start out this morning by reading out of Matthew chapter 27. <clears throat> now when morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people conferred together against Jesus to put him to death. And they bound him and led him away and delivered him to Pilate, the governor. Then when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that he had been condemned, he felt remorse. And returning the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? See to that yourself. And he threw the pieces of silver into the temple sanctuary and departed. And he went away and he hanged himself. 
I want to talk this morning to anyone who's here that may be walking in these same steps that Judas walked. Somewhere along the line, you, you've done something. Uh, you've done something awful. You, you've committed a sin. You may have walked with Jesus, but you can't seem to rid yourself of the guilt that you feel. No matter how you try, you can't seem to shake that, that inner voice, that inner accuser who says you made a choice. You made a poor choice. You cannot undo this. Now it's your responsibility. Maybe the sound of condemnation rings like those coins that you just threw across the floor. Maybe they're clanging across the floor of, a, of an inner temple in your mind. You obviously haven't hung yourself literally, but maybe you're hung up in other ways. When we don't forgive ourselves, it can turn into kind of reality denying overcompensation. It may display itself in just sadness, maybe a listlessness, maybe the capacity for real joy doesn't exist within you anymore. Maybe it turns into an unconscious self-loathing. Maybe you just can't stop thinking poorly of yourself. That may be leading to some sort of a self-sabotaging or self-destructive habit. Or maybe you just have in your mind, you know, I'm a bad person. Maybe I'm just like Judas, and if I'm a bad person and I'm like Judas, I might as well just continue doing bad things. What I want you to realize is what Judas had forgotten. God loves you. He's willing to forgive you, and he has plans for you. It's time to let go of the guilt. Judas had walked with Jesus. We know that Judas was one of the apostles. Judas was there when Zacchaeus expressed sorrow and pledged to live a different life. Judas was there when Jesus said to Zacchaeus in Luke chapter 19, Today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. Judas saw that Zacchaeus received forgiveness. Judas was there when the crowd dragged the woman who was caught in adultery right in front, drug, drug her right in front of Jesus. Judas knew exactly what the law required. She should have been put to death. She should have been stoned. But Judas also was there whenever Jesus saw her remorse. And he said to her in John chapter 8, I don't condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. Judas saw that this adulterous woman received forgiveness. Judas was there when Jesus told the story about the prodigal son who humiliated his father, took half of his father's money, who took it and, and spent it on, on lewd living, quite honestly. Lost it all and... and and then whenever the father saw the grief that the son had and, and saw that he was willing to become a servant in his own father's house, he said, bring the best robe, put a ring on his finger, put sandals on his feet, kill the fatted calf, for my son was dead and he's alive again. He was lost and he is found. Judas saw that the father's children receive forgiveness. Judas had witnessed Jesus' forgiving nature, but when faced with his own sin, he either forgot what he had witnessed, or he felt that his sin was just too much for God to forgive. Maybe you feel that same way this morning. This morning, we're going to look at three characters in the Bible, three of the most well-known characters in Scripture. Uh, the stories that we're going to look at, I'm, I'm confident the majority of us know very, very well. But there are three characters in the Bible that recognized uh, the seriousness of their sins. They received forgiveness, each and every one of them. They accepted that forgiveness. And we're going to look at 
at those stories and then we're going to look at how they got through those and the plans that God had for them. We're going to look at King David. We're going to look at the apostles Peter and Paul. We're going to start out in uh, Psalm 51. If you are following along in your Bibles, I will have the majority of these scriptures up on slides, but I'm going to be basically focused in Psalm uh, chapter 51 this morning, although all of you know, if you've Listen to one of my lessons before. We're going to skip around a lot. So this is a psalm written by, written by David. Uh, this psalm is regarding uh, David's sin with Bathsheba, the adulterous relationship that he fell into with her, and in trying to cover up that sin, uh, he committed a, another sin in murdering her husband, Uriah. David writes Psalm 51 after the prophet Nathan has come and confronted him and has confronted him about, about his sin. And in his guilt and in his shame, in the horror as he's recognized what it was that he's done, he, he pins this psalm, Psalm 51. So we're going we're gonna to look at the first five verses. Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions. And my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless, blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and my sin in my sin, my mother conceived me. Look at the guilt that David feels in these verses. His guilt and his shame is like physical pain. It's weighing him down. David sees that he's sinned against God himself, and he mentions that he sinned against God himself. And he understands, as we understand, he'd sinned against others as well. But he's concerned right now with the fact that he sinned against his God that he is, has done this against his father and he's recognized that this sin is a horrible, horrible thing. And sin is a horrible thing. It always is. Uh, we, we tend to categorize certain sins God does not. And whenever we look at this, we see adultery and we see murder and we go, oh, that's awful. But sin is sin. And sin, regardless of what it may be, has the same consequences for us whenever it comes to our spirituality. Isaiah wrote about just how horrible sin is in Isaiah 59. Behold, the Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save, nor is his ear so dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Sin causes a separation between the sinner and our Heavenly Father. As a Christian, that should terrify us. And we, we see that in David's writing. God is pure. God cannot be around sin. He cannot be associated with sin. Sin is a severe thing. Sin is so severe that God had to send His Son to die for us to take care of our sin problem. In Matthew chapter 26, 74, and 75, we can read about the moment where Peter, the apostle, realized his sin. We read, and, the, and he began to curse and swear, I do not know the man, and immediately a rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the word which Jesus had said, before a rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and he wept bitterly. Jesus had told Peter, that this would happen. Just, just hours before it took place, um, Jesus had told Peter, you're, you're going to deny, deny me three, three separate times. And of course, Peter argued with him. He argued with the one that he knew was the Son of God, with the man that he knew was the long-awaited Messiah. And whenever he heard that rooster crow, 
his sins crashed down on him. Unbearably so, it says that he, he went out and wept. Like David, Peter felt the weight of his sin. When we sin, there should be guilt. If sin ever becomes something that, that doesn't bother us, if sin ever becomes something that we can do and guilt doesn't follow, then spiritually we're in a, we're in a very dangerous place. Ephesians, uh, Paul writes to the church here, and, and he talks about this. He wrote, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air and of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Sin causes spiritual death. Not a sickness. Death. Spiritually. Again, a frightening thought if we're Christians. Without Christ Jesus, we would remain dead spiritually. It's horrible, absolutely horrible what sin does. The account of, of Stephen stoning in Acts chapter 7 is where we see we're first introduced uh, to Saul, who will later be known as Paul. Acts chapter 7, verses 58 through 60. When they had driven him out of the city, him being Stephen, they began stoning him, and the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. They went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And having said this, he fell asleep. Two chapters later in Acts chapter 9, uh, Saul is on the road to Damascus. We know the story. He's confronted by Jesus himself. The confrontation leaves him blind. And he finally recognizes his sin. Romans 5 verses 6 through 10. For while we are still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps... For the good man, someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if, we, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. When we as Christians recognize sin in our life, we know what it is that we need to do. And sin, we understand as we read here in Romans, makes us enemies of God. All of us. Every single one of us, at some point in time, have found ourselves in opposition and being an enemy to God. The Bible tells us the fates of those who are enemies to God that God considers his enemies. And I know that none of us want to be in that position, but that's where Saul found himself. And that leads us to the second point this morning. Whenever we as Christians, or even as non-Christians, find ourselves and recognize that we've sinned, we have a choice to make, and hopefully we make the choice to repent and seek forgiveness. Going back to Psalm 51, we go on and we see that process in David's writing. Starting in verse 6. Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being, and in the hidden part you will make me know wisdom. Purify me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, O Lord, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation and renew a right spirit within me. While verses 1 through 5 of Psalm 51 shows David guilt, his guilt and his remorse, we now start to see his repentance 
and his asking God for forgiveness of those sins that he's committed. The guilt's made him feel dirty. He wants to be purified. He wants to be washed. He can feel that sin on him. He's unable to even perceive happiness. Here it says that he can't even hear joy or hear gladness. And he he longs for that, to, to be able to feel that happiness again. His shame, he says, feels like physical pain, like broken bones. And David's familiar with pain. He was a warrior. He understands what pain feels like. And yet he compares what he's feeling right now spiritually to physical pain. All he wants to do is to be made clean again. His most desperate desire is to repair his relationship with God. Psalm 103, another psalm from David. He writes, For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he, God, removed our transgressions from us. Just as a father who has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. David's sin as bad as it was, God removed as far as the east is from the west. Our sins... As bad as they are, God will remove as far as the east is from the west. If we as Christians follow the example that we see here set by David of repentance and in asking for forgiveness. I want to go back to Ephesians chapter 2. But God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. This is in verse 4 of Ephesians 2. Even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast." It's important to understand the supremacy of God's grace. Sin is horrible, there's no doubt. But it's nothing, absolutely nothing, when compared to our God's grace. There's nobody that wants you in heaven more than God. Not your mom, not your dad, not grandma, not grandpa. Not your husband, not your wife, not your church family here at Conway. There is no one who wants you in heaven more than God. God longs for your salvation. He wants everyone to be saved. And he understands, obviously, more than we can, far more than we can, that that won't happen. But his desire is salvation for each and every one of us. And it's hard for us us to understand that, isn't it? That's really hard for the human mind to comprehend. It's so easy for us to think that God's grace is too small. It's easy to hang on to our sin. Even after we've asked God to forgive it. But the danger is that we oftentimes let pride inflate the significance of our sin. Sin's horrible. Sin is absolutely horrible. There are many who make far too little of their failures, but there's also those of us who make far too much of our sins. I want you to listen to what one remorseful man wrote in his diary. I have done nothing. My life has been spent in vain and idle aspirations and in ceaseless rejected prayers that something should be the result of my existence beneficial to my own species. Do you know who that was? That came from the diary of John Quincy Adams, the sixth president of the United States. Convinced that not a single thing that he'd done in his life made a bit of difference in in, in history, in, in helping even a single one of his fellow man. 
Was his life that much of a failure? Absolutely not. He made far too much significance of his failures to even be able to recognize and to see the great things that he had done. Hebrews 10, 17 says, In their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. Now where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. Why would we want to carry something with us that God's already taken away? Trying to carry what God has taken away makes no sense. It implies that Jesus' sacrifice just wasn't enough. It's like trying to rub out a, a spot, a stain on a shirt whenever it's, it's, already, it's already gone. Jesus paid a great price to set each and every one of us free from our sin. When we don't forgive ourselves, we're subjecting ourselves to the yoke that Jesus has taken away. He's freed us from that very yoke. I don't want you to understand, this is as Paul wrote in Romans 6 verse 1, uh, none of us want to sin so that grace may increase. But it's like driving a car. And instead of looking out the front, front windshield, we're always looking in the rearview mirror. A rearview mirror is, is obviously helpful. There's, there's a reason that it's there. It gives us perspective. We can look back at what we've passed by. Just as our past gives us perspective in the same way. But if we only look back, we can never see the present or we can never see what's in front of us. We can never look forward to the future. Some people focus on the past so much to the extent that that rearview mirror gets even bigger than the windshield in front of them. With this kind of driving forward progress is practically impossible. Matter of fact, a crash is very likely. And so that brings me to my last point. The reason we have to get past our guilt is because we've got work to do. Going back to Psalms uh, chapter 51, and I've gone too far, or I've lost a slide. I've lost a slide. Anyway, chap, uh, Psalm 51, I'm going to read the end of, of that particular psalm, starting in verse 13 through 17. Then I will teach transgressors, transgressors your ways. And sinners will be converted to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, the God of my salvation. Then my tongue will joyfully sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, that my mouth may declare your praise. For, do not, for you do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offering, the sacrifices of God, or a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. We see here that David has moved on from his guilt. Um, he's accepted God's forgiveness and he's ready to convert others. He starts out by saying, I will teach transgressors their ways. He's ready to get back to work. He wants to go out and share the good news of God's forgiveness with others. And honestly, that's why... We have to get past our guilt. He goes on and he says that his tongue will joyfully sing of righteousness. He's ready to worship God through song. He starts talking about sacrifices to God. The Old Testament way of worshiping God. He's ready to get back to work. And that's why it's so important for us to get past our guilt. God has work for us to do. To paraphrase Jesus in Luke chapter 2, we are to be about the work of our Father. Because of his sins, David was uniquely suited to reach people who were in a similar state that he had been in. And he can declare and share God's grace to those people. And we are too. We would all rather be the person that had no sin in their past. But because we've been there and we've done that, we are suited to go out 
and share God's grace with others. Once we accept where we are, once we mourn the fact that we're no longer the ideal Christian that we wanted to be, we can do exactly what God says in Romans 8.28, where he says, all things, God causes all things to work together to good for those who love God, those who are called according to his purpose. He can even take our past sin and use it for good when we go out and we share God's grace and we minister to others who may be going through the same thing that we've gone through. I want to go back to the accounts of Paul and Peter following the, the points where they each recognize the sin in their lives. After the account of, of Peter, and we see that he went out and he, and he wept bitterly, the next time that we read about him is in Luke chapter 24 and John chapter 20, and both of those accounts tell us that, that, that Peter was gathered together with other followers of Christ. By the way, those same followers who scattered when Jesus was taken into captivity. What do you suppose those conversations were about? I can't believe I did that. And I just I can't believe that I let fear take that control of me whenever I saw them come and take Jesus. Man, I just what am I going to do? You know, I, I let him down. I just, I just don't think he can ever forgive me. And then, then we see the account where, where Mary Magdalene and the, and the other women went to the tomb. And the tomb's empty. And they, they, come, they come back and they tell Peter and they tell, tell the rest of the apostles and the other disciples that were there. And they, and they tell him, the tomb's empty. Jesus, is, his body's gone. And then, and then Peter and John have a foot race to the tomb. And, of course, John tells us he won. I always find the humor in that. You know, but, but it's important to understand where, where Peter was, right? He was surrounded by people of like faith and like mind. After Paul is blinded on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9, um, God appears to Ananias... And, and he tells Ananias, go see this man, go see Saul. I want you to heal him. And, uh, and Ananias is like, whoa, God. Yeah, I know this Saul. You know, he, he's, he's, been, he's been hunting for me and, and the rest of my Christian family. And, um, and God assures him that this is, this is what he wants him to do. And so we see that immediately after Paul's lowest point, uh, he is surrounded by, or at least this, this one Christian man who comes and heals him. And immediately he's baptized, and then we see that he's in the synagogue there at Damascus, the same town he'd gone to to arrest Christians, and now he's in the synagogue, and he's, he's preaching Jesus Christ to anyone who will listen. I want you to understand the importance of that, of who Peter sought out and surrounded himself with, and who God sent to be with Paul, and the importance of that. And then I want to go all the way back to Judas, and we see where Judas went. He went back to these, these same people who had taken Jesus, who had accused him, who had beat him, who had turned him over to Pilate. And that's who Judas goes to see. And he obviously doesn't get any support there. They say, you know, this isn't our problem anymore. And where would Judas have been? Where would, what would have happened to Judas if instead of going to that temple, if he'd found that room that Peter and the rest of the apostles and the disciples were in. What would have happened to Judas? We may, we could possibly be reading and studying this morning about his repentance and his forgiveness. 
But instead, he chose to wallow in his sin. And that sin isolated him and led to his death. And that's the beauty of Ecclesiastes chapter 4, starting in, uh, in verse 9 through 12. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. For if either of them falls, the one will lift up his companion. But woe to the one who falls when there is not another to lift him up. Furthermore, if two lie down together, they keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? And if one can overpower him who is alone, two can resist him. A cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. King Solomon, David's son, had some pretty spectacular failures in life. But, but he wrote these words, valuable words that teach us to keep ties with like-minded people. Do you have companions in your life who serve as strands that keep you tied to God's grace? Do you have trustworthy people in your life that, that know your painful past just like Paul and Peter did? Friends who are honest about their own failures and who you can be honest with about yours. Who can help you believe in the redemptive love of God. Whose cord are you a part of? It's hard for us to keep our belief in the outrageous grace of God that Jesus both taught and modeled. Even when we hear the truth that we've been forgiven by others or forgiven by God, Satan has a way of attacking us at times. It's why the book of James recommends that we make it a priority to connect with other forgiven sinners. James 5, 16, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. By sharing our trials with sin and our triumphs over sin, we can be a help to each other. And because of our sins, we're uniquely suited to reach people in a similar state and declare God's grace to them. Earlier this week in, in putting this lesson together, I read a story about an alcoholic and this, follow, this, is a, this is a quote from this man. I prayed every day that God would take away my thirst for drink, and every day when I woke up, my first thought was Jack Daniel's whiskey. Then one day I realized my craving for drink was the very reason I pray every day. My weakness drives me to God. <clears throat> While part of the forgiving of others and wrongdoing involves forgiving and forgetting, we've, we've heard that lesson before, again out of Colossians, to forgive and forget. Whenever it comes to forgiving ourselves, we really need to leave that forgetting part behind. We need to forget to forget. Remembering our sin problem is what causes us to have patience and forbearance with others who may be going through their own sin problem. Remembering how we overcame sin helps us to help others when they're having the same issues. Paul didn't forget about his sins. We read in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 16, I thank Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me into service. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer and persecutor and violent aggressor, yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant, and with the faith and love which are found in Jesus Christ is a trustworthy statement, delivering full acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. Yet for this reason I found mercy, so that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Have you ever considered Saul's story? And whenever we go back to the account of Stephen, he was in Jerusalem where that happened. And we read later on through the New Testament that, that, that Paul made many trips back to Jerusalem. And you wonder, whenever he made those trips, Stephen had a family. I, married, I don't know if he had a wife, he certainly had a father and a mother. Stephen, we know, had a church family. 
He had Christian friends. And, and Paul goes back to Jerusalem and surely, as he's around the church there, he sees these people, right? He sees these friends and possibly family members of Stephen. And so that's what, that's what he writes here. The foremost of all sinners. And for anyone who is going through a trial in their life and they think that my sin is just too great, uh, God cannot possibly forgive me. And Saul says, Paul says, I was forgiven. You're all very well aware of the sins of my past and God's grace is sufficient. And that's what I'm talking about. By sharing our, our, our sins, by letting go of our guilt and getting past that and getting back to the work that we are to be about, we can be a help to others. Saul overcame his guilt, became arguably, arguably the greatest evangelist the church has ever seen, wrote almost half of the New Testament, probably established more churches than, any, than anyone in history. And we know his story. We know Peter's story. We know that Peter preached the first gospel sermon on, in Acts chapter 2. We know he was an elder in the early church. We know that in Acts chapter 10, he was the one that brought the good news to the Gentiles whenever he preached to Cornelius and his family and baptized the whole house. And we certainly know the story of David. His bloodline goes all the way to Christ himself. These three men got over their guilt and were better for it and those who were in contact with them physically were better for it. The lesson this morning has been focused on those who have already made a commitment to follow Christ but maybe there's someone here this morning who has yet to make that choice. The Bible makes it very clear as to what we need to do to follow Jesus and do his will. We must hear Romans 10, 17, believe John 8, 24, repent Acts 3, 19, confess Acts 8, 37, and we must be baptized, 1 Peter 22, 16. And following these steps, you have the same opportunity and the same access to forgiveness, the same opportunity to rid yourself of sin and guilt that you are dealing with right now. If you're here this morning and you're having a hard time getting past your past sin, we understand. Forgiveness can be hard. It can be perhaps the hardest thing that you may ever do. Sometimes it takes continual and repetitious leaning on God, but it brings peace and serenity that can only come as a fruit of God's Spirit. Don't keep yourself weighted down. Don't bind yourself to that shame and that guilt. God set you free from it if you've asked for forgiveness. Forgive yourself. If you want to become a part of the family of God right now, you're, you're never going to make a better decision. If you need the prayers of the church for any reason, we're here for you. Dare to believe God's word. He wants to forgive you.